Today we will be exploring the main similarities and differences of the upper and lower limb muscles. We will use the activity of running to demonstrate these comparisons. Skeletal muscle tissue is the type of muscle tissue that can be found in the body's upper and lower limb muscles. As its name implies, skeletal to muscle tissue is muscle that attaches to bones. As a result, skeletal muscle tissue is the most important in body movements. There are three layers of connective tissue that surround components of the muscle cell, the muscle itself, and attaches the muscle to the bone. Epimysium is the most superficial layer that surrounds the entire skeletal muscle. Paramecium is deep the, to the epimysium. The paramecium surrounds the fascicles of the muscle fiber. Endomysium is the deepest layer of connective tissue. The endomysium layer surrounds each individual muscle fiber. The structure of skeletal muscle tissue is organized into, four, into a four-tier structure. You first have the muscle itself, but the muscle can be further broken down into four parts. Fascicle contains a bundle of muscle fibers. Muscle fiber, long and thin, multinucleated so it can carry out a number of different functions. Nuclei are located at the, at the edge of the muscle cell. The muscle cell is striated in, in appearance. Contains myofibrils and a plasma membrane called the sarcomella. Myofibril found in the muscle cell fiber. Contains myofilaments. Myofilaments, the source of muscle contraction. They are thick myosin and thick myofilaments, actin, which give the striated appearance to the muscle cell fiber. Skeletal muscle contraction can be described by excitability and contractility. Excitability of the skeletal muscle is the ability for muscle cells to respond to an outside stimulus. The muscle's response is, is to create a sequence of electrical charges across the sacromere, leading to muscle contraction. Contractability refers to the ability of the skeletal muscle to contract, leading cells to shorten, leads to, bo to body movement. The stimulus that the muscle receives, which leads it to contract, is sent out from the somatic nervous system, which is the voluntary nervous system. Thus. Skeletal muscle contraction is voluntary. Myofibrils are a tube-like structure composed of myofilaments. Within the myofibrils are multiple sacromeres. The sacromere is where contraction takes place. Length of each sacromere is the distance between two Z discs in the, micro, in the myofibril. Within the boundary of the Z discs, you can find the actin and myosin that make up the myofilaments. When an individual makes the conscious decision to get up and go for a run, voluntary muscle contraction will take place in both upper and lower limbs to produce movement. Many muscles become engaged and work together in order to produce the body movement required in run. Isometric contraction, concentric, and eccentric contraction are three forms of important muscle contraction that takes place in the upper and lower limbs while running. Concentric contraction takes place once a muscle is stimulated. The contraction takes place throughout the entire muscle, causing the muscle to shorten. While concentric contraction shortens the muscles, the muscle fiber during an eccentric contraction lengthen. Isometric contraction takes place when a, muscle, when a muscle length remains constant due to a heavy resistance. While running exerts greater force on muscles of the lower limb, muscles in the upper limb are also engaged in order to help propel the body forward as well as maintain the body's posture for running. The upper and lower limbs differ in size, function, and degree of mobility. The upper limbs function as a non-weight-bearing limb used primarily to position the hand for manipulation and fine motor skills. Therefore, it is less firmly attached and is shorter than longer, larger muscles of the lower limb. The muscles of the lower limb's main purpose is to support and balance the weight of the body. The upper and lower limbs are often grouped by the actions and attachments they are involved in. The upper limbs move the, sh the shoulder, humerus, forearm, and wrist. The lower limbs move the hip, thigh, leg, foot, and ankle. Focusing on the upper limb, it is composed of shoulder muscles like the deltoid, pectoralis, and teres major, and biceps and triceps brachii. 
latissimus dorsi, and the rotator cuff muscles, muscles that allow movement of the elbow, like brachioradialis, supinator longus, and hand muscles, like the extensor and flexor ulnaris, radialis, and digitorum. The lower limb muscles are all different muscles than the upper limb. Some muscles that you may recall are the gluteus maximus, medius, and minimus, quadriceps, hamstrings, and the gastrocnemius. You can see that the lower limb muscles support more weight due to the, than the arm due to the four tendons attached to the quadriceps compared to the biceps in the upper limb. The pectoral girdle consists of the lateral ends of the clavicle and scapula along with the proximal ends of the humerus and the muscles covering these three bones to stabilize the, and support the shoulder joint. The pelvic girdle consists of the os coxae, sacrum coccyx, and the proximal ends of the femur. The appendicular muscles of the lower body position and stabilize the pelvic girdle, which serves as a foundation of the lower limbs. The pectoral girdle creates a base from which the head of the humerus and its ball and socket joint with the glenoid fossa of the scapula can move the arm in multiple directions. Mus muscles that position the pectoral girdle are either located on the anterior or posterior side of the thorax. The anterior muscles include the subclavius, pectoralis minor, and serratus anterior. The posterior muscles include the trapezius, rhomboid major, and rhomboid minor. When both rhomboids are contracted, your scapula moves immediately which can pull your shoulder and upper limb posteriorly. Most muscles that insert on the femur and move it originate on the pelvic girdle. This ensures stability. The psoas major and the iliacus make up the iliopsoas group. The gluteus maximus is the largest. Deep to the gluteus maximus is the gluteus medius, and deep to the gluteus medius is the gluteus minimus. These gluteal muscles attach to the pelvis at the ilium, sacrum, and coccyx and insert on the femur or iliotibial tract. When running, our arms swing in sync with each leg on the opposite side. For example, the left arm swings when the right leg steps, and vice versa. Arm swing is understood to be necessary for stability and to counteract vertical movement. This occurs by contraction and relaxation of posterior and anterior muscles, muscle groups of the thorax. There is not a significant amount of weight being put on the pectoral girdle when running. Comparatively, there is much more movements at the pectoral girdle than at the pelvic girdle. There is very little movement at the pelvic girdle because of its connection with the sacrum at the base of the axial skeleton. The pelvic girdle has less range of motion because it was designed to stabilize and support the body. Running puts the whole weight of the, upper, of the runner's upper body on the pelvic girdle, with the additional force from running itself which is why the pelvic girdle is designed the way it is. Running injuries of the upper and lower limbs. Runner's arm. Force of impact of running does not stop at the waist. Impact travels up the skeleton and muscle sy muscular system through the back and neck. Indirectly causes force absorption at the arms. The pectoral girdle is most often affected. The swing of the arms while running excessively can cause inflammation or degeneration of the ligaments slash muscles at the pectoral girdle. Tendonitis, buritis, and the rotator cuff tears are most common. Buritis affects the bursae. Tendonitis causes the inflammation and ir irritation of tendons within the pectoral girdle. Lower body injuries. Flat feet running occurs at the medial arch of the foot. Reg results in irregularities in running stride therefore leading to pain occurring at the Achilles tendon, shin, and calf. It can also strain the hamstring, quadriceps, knees, and lower back. Morton's neuroma, swelling of the nerve in the feet that leads to pain, numbness, burning, and tingling sensations around the foot, caused by overpronation of the foot while running. Overpronation flattens the arch of your feet and the ankles roll in towards each other, pulling stress on the feet. Achilles tendonitis. This can be caused by improper stretching, sudden speed increases, and hill work during running causes pain, swelling, and stiffness along the back of the foot and heel. Sprains. Many strains to the lower limbs can be caused by running. 
i.e. ankle sprains and calf sprains. Strains of the ankle occur at the tibial talar joints and at the subtalar joints, joints that allow movement of the ankle. Iliotibial band injury. The iliotibial band begins at the iliac crest of the pelvis and attaches at the tibia. The most notable symptom is swelling and pain on the medial, on the medial side of the knee. It is caused by any activity that causes the leg to turn inward repeatedly, such as a worn-out running shoe or running downhill. Far more lower body injuries are seen in running than the upper limb injuries. The lower limbs are the weight-bearing limbs that are absorbing the shock of every stride. Upper limb injuries while running are more common with previous excessive use of the upper body. For example, if a runner has a weak pectoral girdle or has suffered previous injury at the shoulder, the runner is more likely to experience injury at that joint as a result of excessive running. Questions. Question 1. One noted difference in the muscles of the upper and lower limbs was the location of flexion and extension muscles. In regards to running, why do you think that it is important that flexion and extension muscles of the upper limbs are in opposite locations from the flexion and extension muscles found in the lower limbs? Question 2. The most common lower limb injury in running is knee pain. Reviewing the symptoms of the injuries discussed in this presentation and what you know about anatomy of the knee joints, why do you think this is? Thanks for watching.